Let's get started, shall we, with some of the events that defined us as a network. We think of them as our cult classics, if you will. Marathon battles, upsets, slugfests, competitions of supreme intensity, outrageous plays, championship moments, 20 years of great games, starting with the favorites versus the underdogs. 1989, the NCAA tournament. Top seeded Georgetown is matched against number 16, Princeton University. You're talking about David and Goliath. You're talking about one of the great Georgetown teams with Alonzo Mourning against the patience ball control offense of Princeton. I was really stunned at halftime that Georgetown would not be blowing him away. Uh, I guess speechless would be the way to describe us here. The only thing I can say, Dick, is that the head of the Princeton cheerleading squad just oh. called, wanted to know what size tutu you wear. I can't believe this. Smith just threw it away, and Strave is on the back with a nice move. Do you think John Thompson's stomach was shaking a little bit on that sideline? You better believe it. Princeton the ball and a chance to win. Mueller fires. No, the Hoyas escape. And I mean escape. In this confrontation against the Goliath, the David was named Michael, a 17-year-old with his feet on clay, playing the world's number one in a grand slam. It was an underhanded move that defined this match. You are joining us at one of the magic moments in the sport. And we've had some great football games at uh, ESPN, but I tell you, my favorite is the Florida State-Virginia game. It's the first time Florida State was behind an ACC game in the fourth quarter. Florida State did come back. The key part of this football game in the fourth quarter was Danny Cannell with the two-minute jam. Situation gets down to this. Four seconds to go. What do you do? They go to the draw play. And they come up short. This short. Wow, what a football game. Virginia's upset Florida State. It's not if you win or lose, but how you play the game and play the game and play the game. 1987. Islanders, Capitals, and a game that would not soon be forgotten. Adams in front, tips right on goal. It was an incredible game. Each period seemed to get better. Two seconds, one second, and there will be sudden death overtime. First overtime period, second overtime period, third overtime period. The horn sound. 120 minutes have been played. There were a lot of people that weren't too happy with what was going on with our broadcasters that night. Well, I thought the game was yesterday, and here it is Easter today. <laughs> it was a hockey happening. Turn around, LaFontaine, score! Pat LaFontaine! That, to this day, was one of the most exciting games I've ever been associated with. This is what is at stake. USA, represented by John McEnroe, in the final match against Mats Wielander for Sweden. When the match started, you could tell that it was going to be a close thing. 9-7 the first set to McEnroe. Then he wins the second. And that's the way to start with the John is going to run it down. Oh, it's beautiful to watch. It really is. You get to the third set, 17-15, Mats Wielander makes a comeback. Everybody was surprised when Wielander wins the fourth. Now it's down to the fifth and decider. When these teams clash, it's more than just a game. 1995, North Carolina traveled down Tobacco Road to face a struggling Duke team. I thought, you know, Eminem or a mismatch, Blowout City. Oh, they're awesome tonight, baby! Oh, oh. Down but not out, Duke battled back. I mean, you just felt that Carolina, because of its strength and its personnel, would open up a lead and, and blow them away. You wouldn't think about a double overtime game.
glory borne by mutual excellence. We wanted more, and we got it. One game that stands out in my mind was a Minnesota Vikings Chicago Bear football game. If you wanted to imagine an exciting football game, this football game had it. It seemed the Bears were about to end the reign of green with Kevin Butler on for the kick. And you turn around and Warren Moon hits Chris Carter for the touchdown to ultimately wind up winning the game. It ain't over till it's over. The Seattle Mariners, 13 games out in August, forced a one-game playoff in October. The fans were so excited. It was probably the loudest I'd ever heard any sporting event. But Randy was Randy. I mean, he was overpowering. And uh, I think that's the first time I'd ever compared someone to Sandy Koufax. I said, he reminds me of Sandy Koufax. And he did in that particular day. But it just seemed like, you know, everything was going in Seattle's favor. I really thought it was the greatest event that ESPN had ever had. Top of the ninth, 11-3, the Dodgers lead the Phillies. 1990, with three outs to go, it seemed as though the game was well in hand. Phillies have runners on the quarter side. So the Phillies will not go out quietly, that's for sure. match between John LeCicero and Caveman Lee. It was held in a small nightclub in Detroit in the middle of summer with no air conditioning and what these men achieved that night was extraordinary. There was absolutely no reason for him to get up but get up he did and what ensued was very special. In 1992, the Hooters 500, five guys coming in that race with a chance to be the champion. Green flag waves and the Hooters 500 is underway. Maybe Austin came to Atlanta with a chance to be a champion. Now, that left Bill Elliott and Alan Kowicki to decide the championship, and they raced side by side. Kowicki, with mechanical problems, realized that he had to lead one more lap than Bill Elliott to be the champion. Bill Elliott comes off the fourth corner. He wins the first 500. Alan Kowicki is coming off of corner number four, knowing that he's winning the championship. There's the checkered flag for Alan. He's the champion for 92. While Alan Kowicki 
celebrated in victory lane his championship, Richard Petty would take the final few laps around the racetrack, retiring from his famous number 43. undefeated Brigham Young University would be crowned national champion, provided they beat Michigan at the Holiday Bowl. Though only six and five, the Wolverines were a fair match for these Cougars. Bobby Bosco. This young man is playing in an awful lot of pain. Behind and hurting, the Cougars fought back. The touchdown. Late in the fourth, BYU's destiny was in their own hands. Bosco lucky. The touchdown. With a Holiday Bowl victory, BYU claimed the national title. The Stanley Cup. A title so hard to win, a battle so fun to watch. 1994. It had been 54 years since the Rangers had a taste of the cup. A game seven is an incredibly scary thing to have to play when you are heavily favored. And it looked as if it was going to be their game to win, but the Canucks just wouldn't go away. Third period began and Asa Tikkanen ended up taking a penalty and the uh, the Canucks were able to score while he was in the penalty box and all of a sudden it's three to two. With a few minutes to go, Nathan Lafayette hit the post. That's how close the Canucks came. But the maybes didn't apply because it was in fact the New York Rangers Stanley Cup to win.